Hello and welcome to the 71st Bi-Monthly Breastfeeding Coalition webinar. I am Alyssa Spies, the Constellation Program Manager at USBC, and I'm so glad to welcome you to this session. This series is jointly hosted by CDC's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity, and by the USBC. The webinars, referred to as the 222, are held on the second Tuesdays of even-numbered months from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And the purpose of this series is to bring together practitioners and advocates from the field of maternal and child health to share best practices and news, and to network and collaborate on issues of national significance. We alternate the sessions highlighting the work of state, cultural, and local coalitions one month, and national and international organizations the next. Coalition members and breastfeeding advocates from around the country can join us for these free webinars. Um, to get all of our announcements, please join the coalition's learning connection. A user account is required, and it takes only a few seconds to set it up if you haven't already. And all topic and speaker details are posted on the Coalition's Learning Connection as well as the USBC public website. To streamline access to the series, these webinars have been set up, so you only need to register for the series once, and then you are all set. You will receive reminders before each webinar with the topic and speaker details. And we do understand that it's not possible to attend every session live in the midst of your busy lives. So there's easy access to all archived recordings. The webinar presentation, handouts, and video recording of this and past sessions can be found on the Coalition's webinar page. Uh, Operations Manager Danae Schmidt can share the link in the chat box. The link to the webinar page is also in your webinar confirmation email. And so to access materials, if you go to the USBC homepage at usbreastfeeding.org, and you go and you click on coalitions and scroll down to the CDC USBC bi-monthly webinars, that will take you to the information that you um, are looking for in this series. And so for today's session, all participants are in listen-only mode. We'll have about 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers at the end of the presentation. But we hope that this will be as interactive as possible, despite the virtual format. So please share your insights and questions as they come up for you during the session. And to um, enter in your questions, you will go to the control panel on the right side of your screen. And if you don't see it, it might be minimized. But if you click on that orange tab, it should pop out again. And if you scroll down below the audio section, there is a tab for questions. And so when you click on it, it will open up a box for you to type in your questions and comments. If you have any uh, webinar-related technology issues during this session, please send an email to coalitions at usbreastfeeding.org, and someone on staff will do their best to help you out. That takes care of housekeeping and brings us to today's topic. So today's session is Advocating for Reduced Breastfeeding Disparities in Los Angeles County, California. California has the most comprehensive laws protecting breastfeeding in the nation. However, even the most comprehensive law is ineffective if it is unknown, inaccessible, and unenforced. Knowledge of legal protections and strategies for adv advocating for one's legal rights is critical to addressing breastfeeding disparities. When advocates are aware of breastfeeding laws, they can better support new parents in meeting their breastfeeding goals. In today's session, we will hear about the comprehensive advocacy toolkit developed by Breastfeed LA for their 2017 Advocacy Day training last August. The innovative, inclusive design of the day-long advocacy training centered breastfeeding equity concepts and principles and included skills practice focused on putting advocacy into practice. Webinar participants will learn the design elements of the Advocacy Day training and explore the components of the comprehensive advocacy toolkit, learning how to utilize it as a model for law and policy development and implementation in their own areas. And I am delighted to introduce today's presenters. 
Uh, Arissa Palmer joined the staff of Breastfeed LA as the new executive director in July 2015. Arissa came to Breastfeed LA with over 18 years of nonprofit experience addressing various community health concerns. Since 2009, she has been working with the University of Phoenix as faculty teacher in numerous public health courses. Prior to working for University of Phoenix, she served as the Outreach Education Director for a federally qualified health center in the San Gabriel and Pomona Valley. Arissa's responsibilities include providing transformational leadership and strategic direction for the Outreach and Education Department, developing functional training, leadership coaching and development, grant writing and fundraising for the organization. Katie Watersmith is an international board certified lactation consultant and a Lamaze certified childbirth educator. She supports new families at Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles, teaches prenatal classes at the Family Room in San Marino, and is the Advocacy Committee Chair for Breastfeed LA. She has a bachelor's degree in public policy analysis from Pomona College. We are thrilled to have Arissa and Katie with us here today to share the design and implementation of the Advocacy Day Training and Toolkit. And with that, I will turn it over to Arissa. Great, thank you so much. So thank you everyone for joining us for this presentation about advocating for reduced breastfeeding disparities, the Los Angeles experience. Um, although this is about LA, this could also be called how to create a know your rights training and toolkit in your local community. We plan to give you lots of practical tips and strategies for how you can replicate this training in your own local community. So Katie and I have no disclosures to report except to say that we are not attorneys, although we worked with lots of them on this project. So nothing here constitutes actual legal advice. So today, these are the objectives and what we plan to teach you mm -hmm. is how to create your own advocacy toolkit in your own local community. We also plan to provide you with a model of how to replicate this training we want to share our resources with you and give you all the tools that we use in an editable format so that you can recreate it and adapt it to your own local community. And I'm going to share a little video with you because um, these are the stories that actually made us decide that this was something that was needed in our own local community. Okay, so we're having a little volume uh, difficulty with the videos. It was working before, so I'm going to leave that for later. Um, we are actually sharing the link to all of our videos that are available on YouTube, so you'll be able to hear the actual presentation later. Um, so the purpose of the, the toolkit and, and the training were really to give breastfeeding advocates, whether they were professional or volunteers, um, the knowledge and skills to be able to understand what breastfeeding protections are available um, in California for new families. Um, and I can really speak to this from my own personal experience since working on the toolkit and understanding more about um, especially paid family leave and lactation accommodation protections. I use this information every single day when I'm working with new families. Um, I work in a hospital um, where we have many patients who are unaware um, that they have the right to lactation accommodations at work, and that is actually why they're, uh, many of them are not intending to exclusively breastfeed when they come to our hospital. And so being able to educate them about their right to lactation accommodations sometimes actually changes their breastfeeding decision um, because they now that they know that they have the option to express milk at work um, they can see themselves actually continuing to breastfeed longer than they they did when they didn't um, know that so um, the 
we're, that's what was really our goal was to educate folks who are working with new families so they can share that information. Mm -hmm. So to kind of give you an idea of why this toolkit and training came to be uh, and how it actually came to be, many times Breastfeed LA had received stories from community members stating that their breastfeeding rights were violated and they didn't know what to do. We actually share our office space with one of our WIC partners and oftentimes their breastfeeding peer counselors would come to us with a parent who was asked to cover up in public or not provided accommodations at work and they wanted to know how to help that client but they weren't sure what to do. So we we started a rapid response team to address these issues in partnership with the California Women's Law Center and the ACLU SoCal. But what we were finding were that we were the only ones with this knowledge. And we wanted to make sure that the community actually had the knowledge and was able to advocate for themselves. So one of our staff mentioned that it was a dream of hers to create a toolkit so that other advocates in the community would know how to advocate for themselves and others. And we felt that enabling others to advocate for breastfeeding rights really strengthened our community and our ability to advocate for breastfeeding and paid family leave rights and have a greater impact on the community. So at a steering committee meeting, Katie as a volunteer uh, said that she would not only help to create the toolkit, but that she would also want to provide a free training for the community so that the community could learn about their rights. And she was adamant that the training be free since folks should not have to pay to learn about their rights. And that was really the beginning of how this training and toolkit came to be. So what we're going to do now is walk you through our process. We started planning the advocacy training mm -hmm. in January, um, and the training and toolkit were released at the end of August. So we're going to go chronologically. <clears throat> um, so in the first two months, um, what we focused on was creating the outline of topics that we wanted to address in the toolkit. Um, we did this by meeting with a group of volunteers um, who were working directly with new parents and um, Breastfeed LA also had two um, MPH interns at the time who helped with this project. And we just sat down and really envisioned every scenario um, that we had either personally encountered or knew that of, um, knew of in the community where people had had challenges um, with breastfeeding. So, um, paid family leave was a big topic, um, breastfeeding at, in the workplace, um, breastfeeding in public, uh, breastfeeding in schools, both um, K through 12 schools and in higher education. Um, we also kn know that for our LGBTQ community, there are special um, uh, sort of rights that pertain to them. And so, and we also looked into breastfeeding and adoption, breastfeeding and surrogacy situations. Um, and so that was our basis for designing both the toolkit and choosing topics for the training. Um, once we had created that outline, um, the MPH interns actually sat down and went through um, every topic and found all of our state and federal laws that pertained um, to those topics and created an outline for the toolkit. And then that's what we used uh, to select speakers and topics for the training. Um, now we were very lucky because Breastfeed LA has worked with um, a number of different legal organizations doing support for um, community members who reach out to Breastfeed LA. And so we had pre-existing partnerships uh, and, and knowledgeable speakers that we, we already knew of on a variety of topics. Um, and so that made it really easy um, in a lot of ways to just reach out to them and everyone wanted to participate. They were really excited about the idea. Uh, and so we were able to book speakers and free space at the California Endowment all within the first couple of months. Uh, and then we continued to meet weekly to talk about the toolkit and planning the training, usually by phone. So the sponsorship form was created using a Canva template. Canva is a free uh, uh, design software that 
is free to use if you're a nonprofit. So I highly recommend if you're a nonprofit to use them. They create beautiful designs uh, as the example that you can see there. And we also use Eventbrite, which is also free as long as you're not charging for registration. And then we did charge for food, but folks have the opportunity to bring their own food or purchase their own meal at the cafe if they wanted that instead. So after we created the Facebook event and opened the registration via Eventbrite, I literally did one Facebook post about the event, just one. And within 24 hours, we had 50 people registered. And that was so exciting for us because we realized that we were doing something novel that wasn't available yet in the community and that people really yearned for. We were excited to know that we were truly answering a need or a gap in our community and that was really evident by the registration pouring in and also the number of organizations who were eager to help sponsor the event speak uh, without charging a fee and just come out and help for this. It, it really was like something that everyone in the community really wanted and was excited and thrilled about. So months four through eight were um, really focused on the meat of making the toolkit, which um, to be honest is a pretty uh, labor intensive process. So that's it's something that's important to know if you are planning on doing this. Um, yourself again we were incredibly lucky to have a dynamic group of volunteers who helped us um, write the initial draft of the toolkit what we did was we divided up the topics uh, in the toolkit and then people volunteered to use our pre-existing outline and then write the actual content um, and our goal with the toolkit was to make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, in fact, throughout the process, we were checking the reading level um, in Microsoft Word to make sure that it was at a high school reading level. Um, and you know that was a, a real goal that we had because if any of you have looked up laws on the internet, um, sometimes legal information is really difficult to understand. So that was our first step was having volunteers write all of those initial drafts. Then we had attorneys from the Breastfeed LA Board of Directors, the Doula Association of Southern California Board of Directors, the California Women's Law Center, the Center for Work Life Law, and the ACLU of Southern California all review um, different sections and provide edits. <clears throat> and some of those lawyers were mostly reviewing content that we'd written and making edits. And some of them wrote large sections of the toolkit themselves. Um, and that was just such an amazing um, aspect of putting this toolkit together was having that assistance from all of the, the lawyers. Um, they were really passionate about getting this information out. Um, they all had experience working in these different areas. So for instance, the Center for Work-Life Law um, helped a lot with the lact uh, lactation accommodations in the work a workplace scenario and we're able to imagine situations that frankly I hadn't even thought about um, such as if someone were working as an independent contractor um, and wasn't an employee how would the California law cover that person um, and what would that person need to understand about their rights for lactation accommodations Similarly, the ACLU of Southern California has been working a lot with incarcerated women who are lactating. Um, and so they were able to help us not only with uh, writing, writing out the, the legal rights um, for someone in that situation, but we were able to provide their information as a resource um, for anyone in, who is incarcerated and lactating, as well as um, some model policy. So um, that was a huge element of why we were able to put this toolkit together. And then once we had um, had the attorneys look at it, we had 20 additional volunteers read through the toolkit again um, for edits and clarity. Um, and this was really a labor of love for everyone involved, I think, because I had the experience of being in our Google document that we were using at the time at like 10 p.m. on a Wednesday, and I looked at the top part of the screen, and there were you know 10 or 15 other people in the toolkit at the same time, and everyone was reading through it, making sure that um, you know the grammar was right. Um, it was really amazing um, and 
So to, I really felt that in that moment was that this was something that everyone wanted to see happen um, and, that, and we knew it was really important. Um, in addition to that, we had um, a local lactation consultant who um, volunteered to translate the entire uh -huh. toolkit for us into Spanish, um, which was no small feat given that it was 45 pages long and we were sending her last minute edits um, with some regularity before we got to printing. Um, and then her parents, who are also native Spanish speakers, actually helped her with the translation as well. And there were some interesting um, aspects to that, especially because we made the decision to use gender neutral language um, and gender inclusive language in the toolkit. Um, and so our translator was very sensitive to that and was working on how to make sure that um, that was reflected in the Spanish language translation, um, which for those of you who speak Spanish, you know that Spanish has two genders and gender is, is you know, throughout the Spanish language. So that was really amazing as well. Um, in terms of the actual design for the toolkit, uh, we did hire a graphic designer who was amazing um, to help transform it into a more readable format. Um, he did a couple of infographics for us as well um, and helped us arrange the toolkit topically because our goal was that someone would be um, interacting with a new parent, say, who had a question about um, breastfeeding in K through 12 schools and would be able to look that up in the toolkit and flip right to that section. So that's part of why some of the information is repeated in a couple of different places, um, because our goal was that people would be able to look at that section of the toolkit and read everything they needed to know on a particular topic um, to make it really user friendly. So while we were doing all of this with a toolkit, we did a couple things for advo the advocacy training as well. Uh, we hired a videographer who, to film stories on the actual training day because we knew that there were many people um, in Los Angeles who were already advocating for themselves and we wanted to be able um, to give them the opportunity to share their stories and experiences. Um, with the other folks and because that's really inspiring always to see somebody who has stood up for themselves and um, and then we also created postcards to send to assembly members because we wanted to have um, a, a legal advocacy um, aspect to what we were doing in the training as well at the time we were working with the california work and family coalition to pass um, expanded paid family leave protections. Uh, and so we created postcards that people could send to their assembly members right from our event. Um, that law did pass. And so now 2.7 million more Californians are eligible for paid family leave because that law passed. Uh, and then the other um, thing we did, a postcard was for the insurance commissioner um, asking that he um, make sure that all of the LA uh, insurance companies are providing the support, supplies, and counseling that they should be under the Affordable Care Act. So it was a busy couple of months. <laughs> so this is just a photo from our event uh, and a copy of what the program looked like with all of our sponsors listed on it. We're happy to share our program and any materials that will be helpful to other folks in making this easier for them to recreate. So if anyone wants any of our materials in an editable format, you can email us afterwards and we're happy to send that off to you. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the nuts and bolts of organizing the actual training day. Um, any of you who've organized events will recognize many of the things on this slide um, as important elements to planning an event. Um, one thing that was kind of unique about our training was that we decided to end the day uh, with a hands-on skills training. Most of the day was lecture style with uh, lawyers and other experts in a particular topic sharing information, uh, but we decided that we wanted to end the day with giving people a, a chance to actually put their advocacy skills into practice. Uh, and so we worked with the Restaurant Opportunity Center of Los Angeles, which is an organization um, that supports restaurant workers and advocating for their rights to tips, overtime pay, dealing with on-the-job issues. They also support restaurant workers who are being denied lactation accommodations. 
And so someone came from, from the Restaurant Opportunity Center of Los Angeles to help design a training where everyone who came to the advocacy day could get a chance to practice asking for lactation accommodations, both in a straightforward scenario and in a scenario where they're meeting some resistance. So in order to do that, um, we needed to recruit 30 volunteers to facilitate that skills training at their particular table, because those style, style trainings work much better in small groups. Uh, and this was yet again another part of the Advocacy Day training where we just got an overwhelming response very quickly from many, many people. Um, in order to facilitate the training, we asked people to attend a one hour long phone call in preparation. Uh, every single person who facilitated did that. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. Um, and that part of the day, ended up um, working really well uh, and people really enjoyed getting the chance to practice um, their skills. So that was a big aspect of planning the, tra the training. Um, we also had a lot of logistical things that needed to happen. So creating the program and the agenda, printing that, um, collecting advertisements for the program, because again, we wanted to cover our costs and keep the cost as low as possible for participants. We printed the programs, we ordered bags, we had a stuffing the bag party before um, the training. We also had to collect speaker presentations, make sure that we had a copy of their presentation. We created an evaluation. We spent some time also thinking through good prompting questions for the Advocacy Day videos uh, because we wanted to make sure that we, ha we were able to help people tell their stories in a powerful way. Um, we ordered food, we added sponsors to the website and flyer, and again, just like with any event, we had a lot of last minute details that needed to be taken care of, last minute emails and phone calls, um, but everything came together really beautifully in the end. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our costs. I think this is hopefully really helpful for you all to see how you could do this in your own local community. And that it, even though it seems really overwhelming in the beginning, at least it did for me when Katie said she wanted to do this and didn't wanna charge, I was like, oh my gosh, how are we gonna make this happen? But really, um, it, it, it did come together really beautifully, and the costs really weren't that overwhelming when you actually looked at it and you looked at how many people were willing to help. So this is kind of a breakdown. We did charge a small amount for food. We had $250 donated for food, which helps to pay for the cost of our volunteers and speakers to have lunch um, and breakfast. First Five California gave us a $3,000 grant, which covered graphic design costs, videographers, and the printing of the postcards. Um, and like Katie said, we sent over 100 postcards to our governor, assembly members, and insurance commissioner. And a law passed as a result, which is really exciting. Um, and then I did not include staff time on here because we had so many volunteers. Um, and the I, I felt like, even though we did have paid staff on the project, um, it wasn't specific for this. And because there's so many volunteers, this really could be recreated in another setting by volunteers. So when you look at this, the other things on here, um, just to give you an idea of our actual cost. Mm -hmm. So the translation like um katie mentioned someone donated that time that would have cost us eighteen hundred dollars we actually looked at how much that would cost and so we were able to get that for free what we did um as a trade was allowed the volunteer who did the translation to come to all of our seminars for the year for free as a result of translating it um and then we had bags we had a pump company donate the cost for the bags um, as a giveaway, and then we had giveaways and materials donated for the bags. Pine Bar donated, uh, several other companies donated like little tchotchkes to put in the bags. Um, 
you know, um, different programs, put their information in the bags. And then uh, all of the speaker honorariums and travel was 100% donated. I cannot tell you how amazing that is, but because we put on seminars all the time and we pay honorariums all the time, the fact that every single one of our speakers uh, donated their time and said, I want to do this. And they paid their own travel to get here. We had many statewide partners who live six hours from here who paid for their staff to come down and do this training. Um, it, it is really incredible. And so really our total out-of-pocket costs ended up being about $4,400 after all of the donations and everything. So you can see on this slide, this is a list of our sponsors. Some of these organizations contributed um, money. Um, a couple of them, like the California Women's Law Center, the Center for Work-Life Law, and the ACLU actually contributed both money and sent a speaker, and as Arissa just mentioned, paid for that speaker's cost and didn't charge us a fee. Um, we also had support from the California Breastfeeding Coalition, First Five, uh, Moms Rising, Moms Orange County, WIC, uh, several WIC organizations, Cover My Heart, the California EDD. And then we also had uh, Hillary Gray, who's a local IBCLC, who donated to us um, just out of her own pocket because she was really excited about what we were doing. Okay, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. Marissa and Katie, I think we've lost you. I think you may have muted both of your lines. There's a little bit of feedback, it sounds like. Okay, okay, okay. Still getting some feedback. I think there's another microphone that you have in the room that might be connected. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, we, we can't figure out how to get the videos working. But again, we are gonna share the uh, link at the end. So you'll be able to go onto YouTube and watch them afterwards. But they were really powerful um, videos and I definitely encourage you to take a look at them. Um, so this is just a, a look of our, of one of the pages on our toolkit and it's really the thank you to all of our partners, volunteers and community. It would take a long time to thank all of them, but you can see they're all listed in the toolkit and you can see how many there actually are and how long the actual acknowledgements are. So looking at the results from the toolkit, uh, Arissa and I were just looking at this data, which was really fascinating and exciting, um, but we know from uh, the analytics on our website that we've had um, almost 3,500 unique users who searched the website for advocacy assistance just in the past year, which is almost 10 people every day. Uh, the most popular advocacy search on the site was jury duty and breastfeeding, which to be honest was pretty surprising um, and just goes to show how important it is to um, pay attention to what information people need um, and so that's definitely something we'll be taking into account going forward as the folks in the community need more information about jury duty and breastfeeding. Um, other popular topics were people searching for the advocacy toolkit itself, um, breastfeeding laws, workplace rights, uh, laws for parents, incarceration and breastfeeding, and breastfeeding in public. So that just gives you a sense of what topics were popular. Um, we also know that our toolkit has been viewed from 35 states and from nine countries. Um, and that's really exciting as well because one of our goals in putting together the toolkit was both to educate folks in California about their rights, but also give people from other states that may not have um, the kinds of legal protections that we have here 
um, information about our laws so that they can pass similar or better laws in their um, community. So in terms of results from the Advocacy Day training, uh, we had 300 people who registered to attend the event. Um, 265 people actually signed in that they attended. Um, this is something that's important to know if you're planning a free event. Uh, if you plan any event, you will always have a little bit of drop off. Um, that's especially true with events that are free, however. Um, but to be honest, I've planned many free community events and um, we had a much higher participation rate from people who registered than I've seen in other events. So I thought that was pretty good. Um, we also created 16 advocacy videos from interviews that were done at the training. Um, one of Breastfeed LA's staff members um, roles during the training was to ask people if they were, would be willing to create a video with us. Um, 15 of those videos were in English, and one of the videos was in Spanish. Um, each video that we've posted on the Breastfeed LA website has had over a thousand views on Facebook. Um, and the other thing that happens whenever you have an event um, where people come and, and interact in person is that many meaningful connections were made at the event. Um, Breastfeed LA, um, got a new board member who attended Advocacy Day. Um, there was someone who attended Advocacy Day who's now um, a scholarship recipient from Breast LA's lactation educator training. Um, several of the people who are helping us plan the Equity Summit this year um, first participated at Advocacy Day and then were inspired to continue volunteering with Breast LA. Um, so it's a very powerful event. And and really, like I said before, this was a response to a need in the community. And because it was needed, people showed up, they responded, and they were ready to roll up their sleeves and help. We did have a lot of lessons learned. Uh, we are always looking to include more women of color in our planning committee. The toolkit took a tremendous amount of time, and we really needed more time on it than we had. Um, we definitely could have used additional time to finish that. I would highly recommend either covering the cost of food for everyone or not for anyone. That was really stressful for us the day of to track how many people who who paid for lunch and who didn't and where people were going. And that was an added stress that we didn't need. So I would definitely say do it one way or the other in the future. Um, we also wish we had made handouts for some of our most common complaints, issues we see, so we could easily share that with folks. Um, but that would have required a larger budget. And then also, rather than having a PDF, we actually, what we're working on doing moving forward is uploading it to the website as individual pages, because then it's easier to track analytics and exactly what people are looking at. Um, and so that's something that we're working on transitioning to. Right now, we have like the toolkit specifically up, and if people search certain terms, it'll come up, and so we know what terms they search for. But it would be much easier if we just had like specific sections on the website. It also would be easier to update when new laws pass, like SB 63 passed afterwards, and it was like, okay, we need to figure out how to update the toolkit. But if it was not a PDF and it was individual pages on the website, it would be much easier to update any time a new law passed. Um, and also, it's great to have it in more languages. That's definitely something that we'd like to do in the future. So next step, we're hosting a Breastfeeding Equity Summit on October 10th and 11th. We want to translate the toolkit into other languages and plan to separate the sections out that are on the website, like I mentioned. We do plan to do a, a post-evaluation survey to understand how folks are using what they learned during the training and how they're utilizing the toolkit. And we plan to continue to share our resources and lessons learned with other coalitions and community stakeholders like we are today. And then here's our contact information in case you want to get in touch with us. Like I said, we're more than willing to share any of our resources in an editable format so that you can use it and make it your own. Um, here is our contact information so that you can get in touch with us.
And then to actually download the toolkit, this is the link, and you can download it in English and Spanish. And then to watch our advocacy videos, we do have them up on YouTube. We don't have all of them up right now, but in the next few weeks, all of them will be up. Um, but we do have a few of them up right now, and the ones that we were going to show today are up. So if you want to take a look at them, they are there for you. All right, so that concludes our presentation. Um, we know that uh, when people speak up for themselves and their rights, whether it's about breastfeeding in public or breastfeeding in the workplace or however they're using the toolkit, um, that that act becomes a ripple effect that affects everything else in their life. And so that's really um, what our goal is with the toolkit and um, in supporting all of you who may want to make your own toolkit or plan your own training in your community. So thank you, and we are ready for questions. Yes. Alyssa, your mic may be muted. Yes, thank you so much, Marissa and Katie. Thank you for all this great information and, um, you know, food for thought for other folks who are interested in supporting families and their communities. And we have a number of questions and comments that have come in. <clears throat> Um, the first is a comment that just says, uh, you know, no questions, but I hope to view the videos and thank you for your passion to assist breastfeeding families. Um, and we, we so, really wanted you to hear the videos. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to sharing that with the attendees so that they can, they can take a look. Yeah. And, um, and so some folks, um, there was a question that, you know, this work you did was so incredible, and it's exciting to see what you're sharing in the offer of resources, but we might need to start much more humbly. What value do you think there may be in gathering for at least the initial initial conversation? I think, yes, absolutely. I think that, like, that's how we all started here, was just an initial conversation. Our summit, uh, we actually had, like, have a steering committee that was meeting quarterly, and we were trying to kind of revamp and revitalize the steering committee, to be honest with you, and that was a conversation that started out of that. So I absolutely think um, coming together and bringing this idea up and seeing what kind of buy-in you have from other organizations that you work with and community folks is, is valuable. You could even pick one topic that you know is particularly important for your community and start there with just making sure that you have information, for instance, about pregnancy disability leave or paid family leave on your website and then um, go from there. So I agree. Great. Um, next question is, sounds like your existing relationships with legal counsel helped a lot. You know, a lot of great partners. What advice might you have for organizations that don't have that base built already? That's a great question. Um, I think just get yourself out there and start going to some of the those meetings. Like um, we also really partner very closely with the California Work and Family Coalition and kind of like look at what are some of the other coalitions in your local area or your statewide area that you can be a part of. A lot of them have phone meetings. So if you can't make it in person, you can still at least hop on a call um, and get to know folks. Um, definitely, I would encourage you to just reach out to your local ACLU representative, find out who they are and ask them um, if they can partner with you on any issues that you have related to breastfeeding advocacy. I'm sure they would be willing to jump at that. They're always such great partners. Um, then the Center for Work-Life Law is a national partner and they're extremely helpful and welcoming. And so you can just contact them if you want their contact info, email me and I'm happy to send it to you. Um, but they are national partners and they are incredibly responsive and helpful and can help you on anything related to lactation accommodations in the workplace and also in schools, colleges, universities, K through 12 schools, they're, they're incredibly knowledgeable in that area and willing to help. So just kind of reach out to who you know already know about and and re and from there ask them what are some other coalitions that you know of that I can be a part of and get to know who some of those partners are. Great. There was a request if you guys can show the contact information screen again so folks can see how to get in touch with you. Absolutely. Thank you. And 
Um, so is advocacy day something you envision repeating on a regular basis? I think that it could take shape in another form, possibly next year or 2020. Um, this year, sorry, we decided to focus on a breastfeeding equity summit, which really came out of a lot of the response that we received from Advocacy Day. So as an example, one of the things that really was talked about a lot at Advocacy Day that I didn't know so many people had a lot of questions about was about like immigration detention and breastfeeding and incarceration and breastfeeding. Those things really came out at Advocacy Day as conversations. And so we wanted to make sure that we did some further diving deep into those areas, which was the result of the um, Breastfeeding Equity Summit. So I do think that there is definitely opportunity for Advocacy Day to take shape in different forms in years to come. Wonderful. Um, we've had a few requests to have the link to your advocacy videos, and Danae has shared the link in the chat box. So folks that are interested in seeing those can check out that link, and we will um, share them out as well after the webinar. So Great, I know that you you had talked about um, you know looking at the evaluation of the toolkit in terms of how many. Um, you know, views there were, but we had a question that said, you know, what steps have you taken to evaluate the impact of the toolkit? Are there other evaluation pieces that you guys have looked at? Well, we did do an evaluation for Advocacy Day. Um, for the Advocacy Toolkit, I would say it's just been really looking at what people on the website are downloading and what kind of questions have come up since and, um, like just more anecdotal, but we do are interested in doing like I mentioned the post um, the the post evaluation kind of sending out a survey to the folks who who attended the training, um, but possibly also um, who have access to the toolkit to asking them wh what they like about it, what they don't, what are they miss still missing, are they aware of it? Um, I definitely think there's the opportunity for us to do more evaluation of that. Great. Our next question, um, I have taken a look at the Advocacy Toolkit and it's very informative, comprehensive. And the next question is, what recommendations did your team have about length and reading level of the toolkit? So many advocacy tools are written in legalese. So this was something that we definitely focused on, was doing our best to make the toolkit um, both concise and at an appropriate reading level or an accessible reading level. Um, it was definitely challenging to do that, um, both because of the, the, you know, the law, it can be complex, and also um, just trying to figure out how do we explain some um, a, a sort of complex scenario as simply as, as possible. Um, it definitely was a little longer, I think, than we intended, but we, um, we wanted it to be a comprehensive guide. So that's part of why if, if we had been able to do it again and we'd had a larger budget, it would have been nice to create some user-friendly handouts that kind of synthesize and summarize the information um, that people could actually give to their clients or patients, for instance. Um, but we do link to other organizations in the toolkit who have those resources available. So for instance, Legal Aid at Work has a great handout about California's paid family leave laws that I personally use all the time and that I actually was able to get into our hospital discharge packets where I work. Um, so there are links to additional resources that you all can use as well. Thank you so much, Arissa and Katie. I think we're going to turn now, I know CDC has a, an update so we can turn it over to Carol McGowan to share with us. Thank you, Alyssa. And um, first of all, thank you, Arissa and Katie. That was a tremendous presentation. And I appreciate the fact that you evaluated it um, and provided input on the cost and the imp impact that has just started. So thank you very much. 
Um, okay, so I have a very quick announcement. I just wanted to let you know that we're collaborating with CD, with USBC, not with CDC, with USBC on um, celebrating National Breastfeeding Month. So just wanted to let you know that for this week, um, our new feature on emergency preparedness and breastfeeding is live. Um, you can go to our homepage and then click on the first image in the rotating banner and that'll take you right to the information. I gave the links to Danae to post on the um, chat box of the, of the links of the uh, websites I'm talking about today. Um, I think you'll find that this is a resource rich and informative feature, much better than what we had before. We've added a lot more to it. Um, and I think it's really important for us to have available. I mean, we're still fighting with wildfires, it's still hurricane season and disasters just seem to be happening a lot. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is that on Monday, the breastfeeding report card, an abbreviated um, breastfeeding report card will be released. Um, it is going to be abbreviated only in that we're two years away from Healthy People 2020, and this report card is focusing solely on whether we've met or how close we are to meeting the Healthy People 2020 objectives. Um, so in the meantime, follow us on social media at CDC Obesity, and I've also posted a I think my audio was lost. Yeah, there we go. You got it. So yep. where, where did I get cut off at what point? You're fine. We, we have seven more minutes and we're not going to get cut off. So we just, we lost your audio for a moment. I heard you up until talking about, um, you know, looking at the breastfeeding report card as probably people 2020 comes up on us. So. Also, our Facebook page, which, Danae, hopefully you've posted that um, so people can get that off the chat box. And that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. Look forward to checking out those resources. And so, to share some USBC updates, but focusing on National Breastfeeding Month. And so, these are the different weekly themes for National Breastfeeding Month. And like Carol mentioned, we are in Week two, special circumstances and emergency preparedness, and CDC has that great resource on their website. Um, the next week is call to action about how everyone can help make breastfeeding easier. And the final week of um, National Breastfeeding Month is Black Breastfeeding Week, so love on top. And I wanted to share ways that you can connect and participate with um, USBC and other partners during National Breastfeeding Month. And um, my main recommendation would be to check out our webpage. Folks on staff have done a, a great job putting together resources and materials. And so the link is www.usbreastfeeding.org slash NBM. And so that's the place that you can read more about the different weekly themes, uh, a way that you can find materials and resources that you can use and share out with your networks. And we're also really looking for folks to submit things that um, you and your coalitions and organizations are doing that we can help promote what you're doing for this month. So you can submit your National Breastfeeding Month um, resources for promotion either by going to the website um, and Danae has chatted the link or you can email directly to office at usbreastfeeding.org. So share with us what you have planned, what you're you know, thinking about doing coming up for the rest of the month, um, any reflections. As always, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and you can check out the hashtag NBM18 on various social media to be able to see what's going on and then either share or retweet, you know, different um, posts that, um, that you see and help us spread the word. You know, let folks in your communities, in your networks, know about National Breastfeeding Month by sending them that link to the USBC website. And I'm going to go rogue for a moment, and I want to just show you that web page before we close today. 
So like I said, if you go to that link, it gives you more information about the weekly theme, um, and you can check out resources that relate specifically to each week, as well as, um, again, ways that you can submit materials for us. So with that, uh, brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, National Breastfeeding Month is when we join together and intensify our advocacy efforts. So we hope that hearing about the work of Breastfeeding LA has given you ideas to enhance your advocacy. And I want to thank Katie and Arissa so much for being here and sharing all of that wonderful information. And again, connect with USBC and stay tuned. Please share with us what activities you're, you have going on for National Breastfeeding Month. We hope very much that the session will spur ideas for collaborative action. So we ask that you please complete the webinar evaluation and let us know how we're doing. Your suggestions are really valued and help us design future sessions that are most relevant to you and the work that you're doing to support families breastfeeding in your communities. And you also get a certificate of attendance when you complete the evaluation. So I want to say goodbye for now. and. Um, Thank you all for being here, and thanks again to Arissa and Katie, and I look forward to having you all on our next webinar.